complementary feeding, nutritional counseling, and so forth. So these researchers understood that there may be a very important difference in households where there is a mother-in-law versus households where there is no mother-in-law because they're targeting, the, in, the intervention targeting was going straight to just the mothers, right? The mother-in-laws were not targeted. And so what they did was they designed their data collection instruments for their household survey to make sure that they had very clearly uh, differentiated what are the relationships between which of the household members so they could identify all the household, households in which there is a mother-in-law. So anyway, just uh, something that they may not have otherwise thought about and could have very dramatically affected the findings, um, but because they had drawn on this anthropological research, they were able to tease that out in their quantitative analysis. And basically to look at those groups separately Look at what's the effect for groups where the targeting was to the mother, but there was a mother-in-law in the household versus the groups where they were targeting the mother, but there was no mother-in-law in the household. Okay, so applications during the sort of the conduct or the implementation stage of the research. Qualitative evidence can be used to validate or triangulate findings, uh, quantitative findings, also to investigate assumptions about the theory of change. Uh, to learn about population and beneficiary experiences is something we've been talking about a lot at this symposium. And to identify heterogeneity or variations in the population and unintended consequences. So for example, in a school feeding study in Cambodia, they were looking at, uh, they were providing take home rations to the poorest families as a way of trying to buffer against uh, food, food shortages, essentially, and to make sure that there would be sufficient uh, nutritional composition and quantity for children. And the quantitative results indicated that there was no positive effect of this take-home ration on the food consumption of the children, of the beneficiary children. So if you were to leave it at that, you might think it doesn't work. But what they found from their qualitative evidence, from their interviews and focus groups with the uh, beneficiaries, is that something else was happening. Rather than increasing the consumption, they were using that food ration. It actually allowed them to avoid or save that amount of money they would have spent on rice and spend it instead on other kinds of foods to diversify the diet. That otherwise would not have been accounted for. So when you have that picture, it tells a slightly different story about whether or not that intervention was effective, and it's something to think about when uh, considering future evaluations. Also, investigating assumptions about theory of change. So in a uh, vaccination coverage intervention in India, the intervention was a community-led, hyper-local video to try to spur demand for getting children vaccinated. Because the idea was people don't want to vaccinate their kids or for whatever, for whatever reason they're not showing up or they don't think it's a good idea. And they wanted to make sure that the local messaging to speak to those needs was incorporated into these videos. What they found from the qualitative evidence is that yes, there were demand side barriers, but they had completely neglected to measure some of the other qualitative, or some of the, sorry, the supply side barriers. So there was an issue that they observed with the skill and training of the nurses administering the vaccines. And some of the mothers were really upset at the way that the vaccines were being administered, saying, oh, my child is, is getting a boil. And then that started circulating around the village. So they hadn't anticipated that supply side issue. And another thing was they realized that there were some specific communities within their study area that had very different and much more strongly held views about vaccines. And if they had not found that out, it may have been difficult to differentiate the effect between those groups. So they actually refined their theory of change and in order to think about future research that was a bit more uh, nuanced. 
Okay, finally, in the interpretation phase, uh, qualitative evidence can be used to add contextual understanding to findings, to formulate better policy recommendations, um, to reflect on external validity and transferability, and to inform questions and methods for future research. So, for example, formulating uh, better policy recommendations. Uh, one impact evaluation found that in a uh, child development intervention in Mexico, the intervention was effective. So the quantitative methods indicated there was a statistically significant difference and improvement in the intervention group. And at the same time, there was low uptake. So what do you, what do, you do with that if that's all you have? The qualitative evidence helped these researchers understand that many of the people who were participating in the program didn't actually know what the program was offering. They didn't fully understand what was available or what the goals were, and they were participating because their neighbors or relatives or friends had suggested it was a good idea. So it meant that there just wasn't that much use of many of the services because they didn't know they were there. So they ended up making a recommendation, and this is a policy that actually had been going on I think for 20 years without an impact evaluation. So this helped inform um, sort of improving uptake subsequently. Okay, and finally, informing questions or methods for future research. Uh, there was an unconditional cash transfer impact evaluation in Zambia in which money was given to mothers of young children with the idea that this should increase decision-making authority in the household. It should increase bargaining power. And what they found in their, uh, from their qualitative research is that this notion of decision-making authority was just not being understood in the way that they had intended. They, what they wanted to know is whether or not the woman of the household was actually making decisions that influenced what the family would do. But in many cases, the mothers were responding, saying, yes, I have decision-making authority. And they found out later that that meant as long as my husband agrees. So as soon as the husband disagreed, the decision would be overturned. But from a quantitative perspective, that still comes across as a yes, I have decision-making authority. And so what they realized is that they were missing out on some important contextual factors, one of which is that people were interpreting decision-making authority primarily in terms of financial resource allocation and also that decision-making uh, with respect to financial decision-making or financial allocation and with respect to social and relational uh, decisions were actually two totally different things. And they ended up making some recommendations for some more nuanced measures that would get more specifically uh, at what they wanted to measure in subsequent uh, research. Okay, so those are just some small snippets of applications of qualitative evidence in quantitative impact evaluations. And let's think about what are some of the next things or next steps going forward. One thing is that there will continue to be innovation in mixed methods designs, and I'm sure many of you already have ideas for how to do that or you already have applied those ideas. Um, so it will be really exciting to see how that evolves. Another thing is the broader use of qualitative evidence in synthesis of systematic reviews. Now at this symposium there were multiple sessions on the synthesis of qualitative evidence, which is also very important. And, but this specifically is another point in addition to that, which is the use of qualitative evidence in quantitative systematic reviews. You may have seen a quantitative systematic review in which you end up looking at effect sizes across different studies, and they end up saying, okay, overall, yes, we do think this intervention is effective. But what you often miss is, or what is, is lacking in many cases, is the contextual details about what are the conditions in which that works? Why did it work in one place and not in another place? because those contextual details are very important for understanding if you want to try to adopt that. And so incorporating qualitative synthesis into those systematic reviews helps add nuance. 
Additionally, having common definitions and reporting guidelines for mixed methods, impact evaluations, and systematic reviews, and ideally, widespread adoption of some of the same kinds of critical appraisal um, tools and approaches so that we can all have some sense of what counts as a high quality mixed methods impact evaluation and systematic review. And just to note that those three things I just mentioned are also discussed in that uh, paper I mentioned earlier, that mixing and matching paper. And that's available on the 3IE website. Another interesting area will be integration of implementation research and impact evaluation. One of the things that people have recognized as a limitation of quantitative impact evaluations is that we don't end up getting that much information about how the intervention works. That sort of causal pathway, the middle part of the causal pathway. And that's exactly what implementation research is trying to unpack. And many, in many cases, to do that, uh, designs use mixed methods. So there's another uh, working paper on the website that proposes some ideas for how those kinds of methods can be combined so that even if you are trying to understand implementation issues in the short term, you also end up with the evidence you need or the data you need to assess impact. Additionally, something you all are probably also familiar with is other kinds of methods to look for reasons why an effect occurred even when you don't have a large sample size. So you may be familiar with some of these methods, realist evaluation, general elimination methodology, process tracing, contribution analysis or contribution tracing, qualitative comparative analysis. So if you're familiar with these, you'll know that something that they all have in common is a very strong emphasis on clarifying the theory of change. And in addition to that, articulating if this theory of change is true or if this causal pathway is true, here's what we would expect to observe at each of the steps along the pathway. And for most of these, there's this idea of proposing multiple alternate pathways and then trying to test them out. For, for instance, for general elimination methodology, you look at all the possible explanations for any change in outcomes that you've observed, or you, you think of whichever plausible ones, and then you try to rule them out based on gathering additional evidence at each step of these, of the sort of theorized causal pathway. And finally, uh, continuing to enhance research transparency. At 3IE, one thing that we have always emphasized is trying to make sure that the results of the studies that we fund are replicable. So for that reason, we require that each of the studies can be undergo what's called a push button replication. That means that after the study is completed, the researchers send in their code, you rerun the code, and make sure at least that you are getting the same results that those researchers reported, bare minimum. In addition to that, we make sure that all the data is de-identified and made publicly available. So if anybody else wants to analyze it or rerun the analyses, they can do that as well. And with respect to qualitative research, uh, we are having, we're starting a conversation with the Quality Data Repository at Syracuse University in New York to figure out whether there's also a way to de-identify qualitative information and make that publicly available. For obvious reasons, much more challenging to think about but it's sort of an interesting conceptual question. Okay, finally, I want to highlight a few resources that you might find of use. I mentioned before that uh, there are um, mixed methods evaluations, impact evaluations in our repository. So if you're interested in looking at other examples or examples of what other researchers have done for applying qualitative evidence and impact evaluations, you can go through our website and look at any of those. So we have, uh, as of a couple of days ago, 4,300, sorry, 4,803 impact evaluations on our website, 188 of which are from Brazil. Um, and on our website, if you were to Go to the option, the drop down, and select mixed methods. You see we have 85. So any of those 85 
mixed methods and impact evaluations will have their methods written up for how they try to approach um, their research question. So it's a useful place just to get ideas about what other people are doing. And in addition, we have uh, systematic reviews. All the systematic reviews that we conduct, we incorporate a qualitative synthesis component to it to try to contextualize the findings. And the methods for that are also written up in the systematic reviews. So you can sort of see an example of what that looks like um, as an output, as well as see the different methods. And those methods have evolved over time. Um, and finally, something that might also be interesting is the evidence uptake. So after the results are produced, after the impact evaluations are done and the systematic reviews are done, we also want to know whether or not those research products actually changed decisions or policies. So we do contribution tracing, and we try to figure out how plausible, how confident can we be that these different products actually made some sort of a policy or programmatic change. Um, and, and basically, the contribution tracing process is similar to what I described before, in that it's trying to plot out or map out the causal pathway that if this did have an effect on that policy, what are the steps that would have had to happen? And what data would we need to verify each of these individual steps? Um, so that's also an interesting uh, thing, and you can read about that in the, uh, the policy briefs that we have in our uh, evidence use uh, repository. So with that, I want to conclude and open it up for discussion. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Uh, how, sh how should we do this? Okay, now, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I, uh, I, I really like the, how do you just frame like all the things that PIE uh, does on that. So I just wanted to ask you like, how could you just kind of like incorporate in this all of this evidence gap map and also in the type of like question you're addressing like by several impact evaluation and um, like, like this, the quality of the studies that might be included there, right? So you also kind of like have a map of what it's being out there, right? But like, is it a def different category if it's the quality of the, the, the evidence that you're just compiling could be different from some like specific areas or intervention? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, thank you. Uh, so in terms of quality of evidence, uh, there are a few things. First of all, the, each of the impact evaluations that each of the impact evaluations that go in the repository have to meet a minimum set of standards in order to be in order to be put in. Is this still working? Not sure if this is still working. Maybe maybe it is still working. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's the first thing. And uh, with respect to the evidence gap maps, those include impact evaluations. They also include systematic reviews. So for all of the systematic reviews, there's another uh, quality appraisal process. And that basically assigns the systematic review to a category, high confidence, medium confidence, or low confidence in terms of the methods applied. And so in the evidence gap map, those are color coded. So I think it's the green for high confidence, orange, I think, for medium confidence, and red for low confidence. Uh, so you can sort of see. Yeah. This is the, the Uh, so it's the confidence of how confident uh, we are in the findings of the study. So that doesn't mean that there was an impact that was positive. 
it's that the study was very well done and that you can look at it and you say, okay, this is a quality that met the rigor and the quality standards of what we would expect. Oh. Very good. And what tools do you use to evaluate the quality of the systematic reviews, especially for qualitative uh, systematic reviews? So we, at this point, we don't have uh, qualitative only systematic reviews. So I just should clarify, the systematic reviews are quantitative systematic reviews, uh, but the ones that are implemented by 3IE also include a qualitative component. So they try to gather additional evidence, qualitative research, program documents, and so forth to help contextualize each of the studies. So it's basically trying to ask for additional information about each of those, um, each of those study contexts. Um, and so for that, there is a quality appraisal or critical appraisal checklist, and that is available on the website. Um, it, yeah, it, that's, that's on the website, uh, so you can see exactly what that is. Uh, but yeah, we don't do, as of now, uh, qualitative systematic review, like of qualitative research. Sorry? Uh, there very, they're very well may be interest. I, I can't speak to what is the future direction, um, but I do know that we have, the, the leadership of the organization is very interested, as I mentioned, in that sort of pragmatic paradigm of thinking about evidence. And so they're looking at how can we look for causality in whatever way that may be possible, recognizing that there are some kinds of contexts in which, or interventions in which, you simply cannot have the sample size you need for statistical uh, testing. Um, sometimes, for instance, if your intervention is a, a nationwide policy, and sometimes your N is one, you know, you can't really have that kind of a comparison. So, I can't answer your question in terms of what our specific next steps will be, but I think qualitative research is definitely of very high interest to the organization. Thanks so much for a really interesting um, presentation and for sort of bringing everything back to how do we think about qualitative evidence um, more broadly in um, sustainable development goals. Um, I had a question for you about um, what you saw, I think, as some of the future research priorities um, for 3IE, um, particularly related to improving the transparency of the reporting for the qualitative evidence. So you mentioned about sort of a push-button approach to assess someone's analysis for quantitative approaches, and of course, um, something like that would be much more difficult to implement for qualitative research. So I wonder if you have some ideas about what would be the level of um, sort of backtracing that you would be looking to do through the qualitative evidence, whether it's posting interview transcripts, focus group transcripts, or looking at sort of a higher level of analysis and making that available? Also a great question. Um, I'm going to disappoint you that I don't have the answers. Um, but at this step, we're really first trying to explore the ethical considerations um, before even getting to some of the methodological or technical considerations. Uh, because if, for instance, you were to make transcripts available and you have all of the transcript content for a particular person, you can piece together much more about who that person might be or what kind of context they might be living in or some of their characteristics, uh, which could be uh, a risk to those people. So it also raises the question of what does de-identifying mean in, in the context of qualitative research? because the way you speak might also be an identifier, the words you use. Uh, so that we're sort of at an early stage in terms of thinking about this. And if anybody has ideas or has already done this, um, we would love to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a comment. This is being done in the UK. There's a UK repository where qualitative data have been deposited now for probably five years. So 
I'm happy to send a link. I, I'm not part of that repository, but I know it's there. So then they run uh, training, training workshops and so on to help quality researchers deposit their data in an ethical manner. So if you're interested, I can send the link. Yeah. Very Get to get your dinner voucher. <laughs> Just outside. Thank you. Thank you. We might not go till 3.30, so if you end up leaving and you Thank don't you. have your dinner voucher, pick it up. Uh, so hi, Douglas. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more on the evidence uptake? How do you measure it? How does it... Uh, you said it was the contribution tracing. How does it work and how can we do it in other contexts? Thank you. Yeah, uh, so this is a topic that is not my particular area of expertise, so I won't be able to speak in too much detail about it, but basically the idea is that you first take stock of all of the claims that were made about what the evidence use was. So for instance, this study influenced this policy, or as a result of this study, um, funding was reallocated from A to B, or whatever it may be. And often those claims are generated through conversation with policymakers or people in the program, so you end up with your list of claims. So then for each of those claims, you want to figure out, okay, if that had happened, if that is the impact, if, for instance, the policy did change, and then you believe that or you hypothesize that it was as a result of your study, then you have to piece together all of the stepping stones in order to get there. So you would think about, okay, when was the study released? Who saw the study? Who discussed the study? In which meetings would the study have to have been mentioned? Or who would have had to look at the study in order to raise it in a meeting where a decision was made to reallocate resources or end funding for a program and so forth. So you try to piece together all of those pathways and you might have multiple possible pathways. So you think about which ones are the most plausible and then at each of those steps try to figure out what kind of evidence would, be, uh, would help me feel more confident right, that this actually happened. And that could be quantitative or qualitative evidence. Um, and then there's a, there's a sort of process for evaluating that that ends up getting quite a bit more involved that uh, I can share with you through a paper. Hi, I have another question. I'm down here. <laughs> Coming in from the um, virtual symposium. Um, we have a question from um, Megan Wainwright, who is currently in Portugal, and she says, can you have an entirely qualitative impact evaluation, or is it contingent upon having quantitative outcome data as well? Well, this is, this is uh, it goes into these uh, small n methods, and it's something where impact evaluation for a long time has been predominant, well, has been almost entirely uh, quantitative. And even as I noted in the beginning of the presentation, impact evaluations, even quantitative impact evaluations, were not done that much for development work uh, prior to 2006. If you, there's actually a curve on slides that I've seen in multiple presentations where the number of impact evaluations goes up very steeply uh, around that time, 2006 and thereafter. Um, so the use of quantitative impact evaluations is actually fairly uh, recent, and qualitative impact evaluation as a concept is much more recent than that. Um, and so I think where we are in our understanding of qualitative impact evaluation is that there are some of these small n methods where you are looking for qualitative evidence to try to piece together a chain of evidence that shows causality in some form um, or that, uh, like through the um, qualitative comparative uh, analysis, looks at different cases 
in which an outcome happened or didn't happen, and then you look at all the factors that may have explained one or the other, um, and then look to see whether the evidence is there to support that theory of change. It all sort of comes back to the theory of change. Um, so I would say, I wouldn't say definitively that yes, there's this method, this method, and this method that are entirely qualitative that can and should be used for impact evaluation. Um, but I would say there is a lot of great thinking in terms of thinking through what types of qualitative methods get you very close, at least, and generate some plausible sense of uh, linkage between cause and effect. We don't have to stay until 3.30. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, it was really a pleasure to have you here. And also, thank you for the wonderful questions. Those are very good. And if you want to talk about any of this further, please come find one or both of us afterwards. And I will ask about that uh, qualitative repository. Thank you. Thank you.